Here we are at uh, Paul Kasman Gallery, uh, where uh, St. Clair Saman is showing uh, his newest sculpture, uh, Psyche or Psyche? Psyche. Yeah. Okay. And um, it's a, a marvelous piece, and we're going to talk about his uh, career, his uh, beginnings in art, uh, as well as this uh, fabulous sculpture by the time we're done. So, uh, St. Clair, how did you first become interested in art? When I, was, um, when I was a kid, when I was five, six years old, my mother used to, since we lived in a small village and we didn't have access to, uh, to art books, very few, uh, that there were in the library of the city, but uh, very often in, in magazines there were articles about art, about contemporary artists as well as, as uh, uh, old uh, masters. And my mother uh, made albums that she cut out all those articles about Velasquez or about um, uh, Picasso and about everybody. Every, every art, I don't, for some reason she was interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. And I grew up looking at those albums that she created. And she even, uh, she, I remember that she said, oh, I, I just made a new entry in, my, in this album here, but it's this crazy Spanish art that I hate, but I put it there anyway, it was Picasso. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so she was, uh, she was very important in my, in my artistic formation in the very beginning. Right. Would that have been the 60s? I mean, there, there was, was the at 60s. that time people did uh, create scrapbooks on, on their interests. Yeah, uh, that was... Like That's what we she would did. use the internet nowadays to bookmark things or something like that. Correct. That was what she was doing. Yeah. And um, so your initial works were drawings and prints, right? I started drawing when I was around uh, 14, 15 years old, and I basically self-taught. I, I, I learned how to draw after doing a lot of it for many years. When I was uh, 18, I was uh, working professionally as an illustrator for, uh, for a couple of magazines, uh, namely a magazine called Planeta, which was a uh, typical 60s uh, magazine about uh, um, all the interests at the, t at the time, which were, were uh, fantastic realism and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, typical uh, material from, from that time. And I was making illustrations for this magazine every month. Then, uh, so I started actually as an illustrator. Then uh, eventually, when I was 22, I went to Paris and I, start, uh, I started making etchings. So that was the beginning of my artistic uh, career. Right, and um, so uh, you moved to New York from Paris. Um, where you, you also studied in Paris? Yes. I studied at the Beaux-Arts. I yeah. studied for three years there. Then in 78, I moved uh, uh -huh. to New York. And, um, and you basically then started your career in New York? Um, or had you already been showing? I did not, I did not start career in New York yeah. at all. I was, I was selling my etchings mm -hmm. uh, with some publisher. And, uh, but I was basically, I had a studio, and I was basically printing for myself and for other people. Uh, but arriving in New York, I immediately got in touch by, by chance, but it was, you know, I don't believe there is anything really by chance. Mm -hmm. And I got in touch with several people who introduced me to the, to the art world, to, the, to, the, to, to artists. And I, be, I befriended all these people and I, my interest shifted enormously from what I was doing towards art. Because what I was doing is, it was like an offshoot of illustration. I don't consider that part of my work as, as a continuity. There has no continuity what I'm, what I'm doing now. Right. Um, so the people that put you in contact with the New York art world, were they expats from Paris or expats Not at all. from Brazil? You probably know him, Mr. Alan Jones. Oh, right. And, uh, and then, uh, then he put me in contact with uh, the whole group of people that mm -hmm. was Taro Suzuki, Jeff Plate, who died, uh, Jeff Kunz, who had just arrived from, uh, from Chicago, I guess, and a whole, a whole lot of other uh, artists that are in the East Village, and uh, well, we're hanging out. Right, and how had you met Alan Jones? In a, by chance, in a party. All right. At a party. Right. And you started talking about We started talking, and we became, we became yeah. best friends. We started right. seeing each other every day. Right. 
And um, so what was the, um, what was that, the East Village uh, scene like when you got here? Because you moved uh, directly into the East Village, right? More or less, I spent one year uh, somewhere uh, uh, on 6th, 6th Avenue. I, I started working at the printmaking workshop, which mm -hmm. was uh, fantastic. Blackburn. Well, Blackburn, yes, yes, it was fantastic. This man, uh, Bob Blackburn, was an incredible guy. And uh, I, I worked for many years there. But I moved to this village a year later after having arrived. To f uh, and a few, couple of years later, it was the big, uh, you know, East Village uh, explosion of the small galleries. And I think it started with Fun Gallery, right? Mm -hmm. And then it started, uh, right. many other small galleries start opening. Yeah, it became a scene. It became a, a, a real scene, yeah. yeah. So it was amazing to, 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 to be in that scene. Yeah. And um, so what led you to sculpture? Uh, uh, to sculpture, what led you to become the a funny story? I, I was uh, uh, I had stopped making my my etchings. I had, I sold my press because I was really disappointed with that. Uh, I wanted to expand, and I think that with if I kept with the printmaking, I would just stay stagnated. Uh, and for two years, I uh, tried everything. I made drawings. I made reliefs. I made this. I made that. Try even painting, which is not my vocation even though I heard that I'm not a bad painter. Uh, but one day, uh, you know, my formation, I, w I grew up in, within conceptual art. That was very normal for me. So if, when I left my illustration type of work, I went into, I thought that I went into conceptual art, and I had this idea that I wanted to explore the, the condition of an artist, the existential condition of an artist, who is actually not very different from the existential condition of anybody at all, where you are given total freedom, but no criteria at all, right? You have to create your own criteria. So that's the, the great uh, existential uh, uh, problem of the artist and of anybody at all, is that you do have, you can give yourself complete freedom, and by that point you have no criteria, you don't know where to begin. So I decided to create a piece, a conceptual piece that would, uh, very simple, I would do work nine to five in my studio, I close the door and I, and I can do anything I want. And everything I will produce, I'll make, is gonna be part of this final large conceptual piece. So I had a table with, uh, where I had uh, paper, I had watercolor, I had you know, all sorts of materials. And among those materials, I, I had acquired uh, like 40 pounds of clay. Funny thing, the, my first day, instead of drawing or making sketches or little wire frames, whatever, I start making clay figurines. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing, it was a discovery. I spent the whole day doing that, and by the end of the day I had produced ashtrays and uh, little erotic figurines or penguins and any sort of thing. And I was quite surprised by my own uh, 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 activity. Next day, I kept doing that. The third day, I broke up my uh, my uh, rule and I went to the art supply store and I bought more clay. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the week, I had a whole army of uh, guys looking at me. You know, uh, mug mugs with heads on them and all sorts of strange things. And at that point, I said, "This, all this little army of." pieces looking at me, they are powerful. They don't, uh, now my uh, concept, my, my first concept was, that was this overarching uh, piece that was anything I was going to be doing would be good enough. So mm -hmm. they, it became just like a, a, an excuse, you know. The pieces themselves were was stronger than my idea. So I said, I'm just gonna keep making them and forget about this uh, conceptual idea. But the conceptual idea was excellent because it allowed me to complete reduce all criteria in art to a tabula rasa, where everything is good as, 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 good as, as anything else, which means an inspiration, a, a whim, uh, something that I've seen, some strange idea, anything has the same value. There is nothing one that's more important than another. And that gave me a great freedom. So in a way, the pieces, they were deciding how to be, what to be. They were the ones who were dictating 
my actions rather than the opposite. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that did stay for the rest of my career until today. There is no, uh, I do not have a, how do you call that, a, a strategy. Mm -hmm. And I replace it by a whole series of uh, tactical maneuvers, not the strategic maneuvers. So I don't have an overarching idea that will, besides this freedom and this exploration of any possibility of, the, of art. Um, I see your work as a, a mix of um, abstraction and a surreal form of figuration. Um, who are your historical heroes? Um, who are your artistic predecessors? Oh, there are so many, but they are yeah. so, and they are so good. The, uh, uh, Gaudi. Gaudi was my first shock because I, I knew nothing about Gaudi. I was totally ignorant. And I arrived with my brother in a, in a ship from Brazil that made a stop in Barcelona mm -hmm. before it went to Cannes, which was our final destination. You see, we were going to Europe for the first time by boat because it was the cheapest yeah. way for kids to, to get to Europe. The airplanes were still very expensive. Uh, those boats now don't exist anymore. Uh, and uh, so we had a whole day in, in, in Barcelona. We took a cab driver who said, you, have, you don't know Barcelona, but we're gonna take, we're, we, I'm going to take you to all the Gaudí places. Mm -hmm. And I said, who is that? And when I saw the, the, the houses and the Sagrada Familia and the Parc Güell and all that, I was absolutely astonished. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. So that stayed as a very strong influence in my mm -hmm. work. An artist who happens to be an architect, but uh, has a total global vision and is completely is formal at the same time, it's, it is, uh, well, it's pure invention. You know? mm -hmm. Makes me think, when I think about this work, makes me think of, the, of uh, something that people say that's unrelated, but uh, the string, uh, the string quartets of Beethoven, you know, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. such an incredible invention of form and music. So that was a great influence, but then I, I of course, I was, I, I, when I started making sculpture, I went back to, to Brancusi and to, and to Bernini and right. to... And, looking and, uh, at the masters. Looking, looking at the masters, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I could see, when you mention Gaudi, I can see how that could have an impact on you, but I also see the forms that still, um, the shapes that you still deal with uh, yeah. in your work. Um, some of your works appear to have a, uh, a function in a practical or ritualistic sense, um, yet they are not actually used. Um, is this an ironic aspect of art making for you? Uh, <clears throat> Not ironic in the, sen the normal sense. Ironic in, uh, perhaps a little bit, but in the sense where uh, irony is fruit of, uh, of certain social barriers being crossed mm -hmm. or certain uh, conventions being, being, uh, uh, being mixed together, creating something that is not very conventional. Uh, what happens is that in my first show, I made all those figures in small pieces. So uh, my first show in 85 at uh, ne Daniel Neuberg Gallery was a forest of uh, 50 pieces or even more, each one with its own pedestal. And it was, I had a lot of success with that show. But then a second show, I started making bigger things. And those bigger things, I started thinking, why are we inspiring ourselves, one making sculpture, only of sculpture? Whereas uh, our life is, we are surrounded by objects of all types, and mostly objects that we don't really notice, like chairs, because we are sitting on them. We don't see a chair, we are sitting on it. You take it for granted. And so, uh, so I, I, I started thinking, maybe I would like to make pieces that they can go into the viewer's mind tr through two doors at the same time. Mm -hmm. through. The, he can see it as an artwork and at the same time as, as let's say, a chair or a table or, a, or another type of object. And those two uh, takes on the work, they create an interference pattern. Right. They create this, this, and that is going to be interesting. I so I started making lots of pieces that look like uh, furniture, but they couldn't be used. They, it would be awkward to use them. 
Actually, I had even the, the, there is uh, uh, um, Joel Wax, mm -hmm. who is, is with the Warhol Foundation. Mm -hmm. He was in LA. He was a collector and uh, yeah, councilman. Councilman, yeah. yeah. He became a friend, and he saw one of my pieces that was uh, called Three Sit Three Seats. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was some four by fours with the baroque legs and those aluminum seats, uh, mm -hmm. very awkward. And uh, he said, "Oh my God, you could draw design something like that for the the subway system in LA that we are." And uh, but when he saw the real thing, he said, "No, that's impossible. Nobody right. can sit on that." Right, right. <laughs> it's it funny. Was, I uh, when you mentioned the the show at Daniel Newberg in 85, I had the benefit of seeing that show, and I think we met either then or in your Perhaps, following yeah, yeah. show. Um, and that work still uh, still resonates with me, and when I think of your work, I think of those, uh, first, of those small uh, organic forms that, you know, that had some reference in the real world, but also then, you know, as I said, in this world of abstraction or surrealism yeah, yeah, yeah. or dream. Um, so, um, at some point, you moved back to Paris to work. Uh, what is it about the the city, or uh, and the closeness to um, to other European cities? Uh, I know you now live in in France in Bourgogne. What is it about uh, being in Europe for you that uh, that you find so uh, uh, appealing? Well, it was a series of circumstances too. Once I came to New York, uh, I stayed here. From 78 until until 80, no, until yeah, 86 or 80, I, I, I didn't even go back to Europe. I was between America, uh, be, between America and Brazil. Mm -hmm. But uh, I got married to a French woman. Then I stayed right. with uh, with her f between New York and Paris for a few. We had a double residency. We had a, an apartment in Paris as well. Uh, then eventually we, we divorced, and uh, then I went back in, in 2005. I, I went back with Svetlana, my, my wife, and my child, in order to make a, a large work for a museum there. There is a Musée de la Chasse, the Museum of Hunt and Nature in, in Paris. And I got together with this uh, curator, uh, Monsieur Dantenez, uh, and uh, we got along and I had many ideas of how to uh, to create bronze pieces for that museum and uh, so I spent two years mm -hmm. working on that uh, on that I made all the handrails and uh, panels and uh, it's it's a very very major work that is still there will we'll, we'll be there forever and that and since my child was in school I didn't want to take her out of school we stayed a few more years until she finished her uh, High school, her, uh, her scholarship. We came back in 2011 to New York. And um, since we're talking about um, your work process, maybe tell me about your uh, studios. Um, you have still the studio in New York. You have yes. a studio in France. Yeah. And you also have a studio in China. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. yeah. I started working in China in '99. Mm -hmm. I went there uh, with my wife who knew already China and really want me to, to see. And uh, with the help of friends, I met artists there, and I met people who could help me with my work. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was making very large pieces. I had large commissions, one for, for, for Motorola uh, in, in uh, Schaumburg, near Chicago, mm -hmm. another one for Norway. They're all large bronze pieces. And I realized that in, if I made them in China, it would be more convenient, cheaper, mm -hmm. and uh, and mostly would take much less time. So I worked with uh, with a foundry in Dalian where they make propellers for huge ships, mm -hmm. and they made a fantastic castings for me. So I was very happy with that. And then I kept working. I kept, I kept going back to China, and uh, eventually I I had a studio there. I still have. Right, and. Um, uh, you um, can you tell me then about the production of, of a psyche that uh, you made that in China, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Psyche. Long, yeah. Uh, this this thousand pounds or thirty thousand pounds marble boat on a on a bronze cradle. Um, mm. Tell me about uh, the making of this piece. 
in uh, in 95 or 94 I had a collector who told me I would love to have a piece for uh, that would that would be close by in my swimming pool in the basement in, uh, in his house in London Mayfair he had a beautiful uh, uh, house there and uh, and I knew his house and I knew the swimming pool and I and I made a joke and I said well uh, we'll make a boat for your for your swimming pool and he looked at me and said why not why can you make a marble boat and I said yes and he looked at me and said one that floats and I said of course so I went to my studio I had the large piece of stone it was like uh, six feet long and I carved the boat and it was very thin wall, so it could float, you know. And actually, I tried it; it did float, but it was a, it was a very small piece. And uh, funny enough, he never bought it, but I sold it immediately to somebody else. <laughs> it's not a problem. He uh, uh, so that mar that marble boat gave me the idea a few years uh, after to make a larger version. But then I started imagining this larger version. It was like I, I could see this boat going into the in dark waters. Mm -hmm. And I became obsessed with this idea. Made many drawings and uh, many, uh, many models, uh, different models, every possible size. And, uh, then I decided I wanted to make it. I researched marble all over the world. I went to it in, in, in Greece. I liked the marble. Then I had problems with the, about the size uh, in Brazil. But then I had problems in Brazil with the carvers because it was. Uh, finally, I said, "What am I talking about? I mean, in, in Sichuan they have the most fantastic marble. If I go, I go take a look there." So uh, with with some associates in. Uh, in China, I went to Sichuan and I found the marble uh, that I needed. Fantastic, beautiful region, you know, very rainy and uh, with those incredible bamboo forests. It was a quite, a, quite a trip. Then I said, I'll make it in my studio so we'll be able, I can follow it. I don't, I don't want to, it, it, that was the kind of job that I really did not want to give somebody to make and do any, any way you want. Yeah. So I planned the whole thing. I supervised. I created the tools to move the boat up. You know, I, I, for instance, I didn't like the idea of carving the boat upside, you know, turn upside down, carving it in the, the outside, and then turn it around and curve it inside. I did all the opposite, which made it more, much more complicated. Mm. Uh, and it, it was a very, it was probably the most difficult piece I've ever made. There's no doubt about it. And um, how many, uh, w did you start with a big block? And how many, uh, how, how many days of labor did it uh, take to, uh, to carve it? Well, I interviewed, I interviewed many crews, two, two or three crews, and uh, they all wanted, to, they all talked about money and they talked about anything but about the marble. And then I interviewed a crew that I liked very much. Already from the beginning, they looked good, those three people. And the chief, he said, uh, yes, I think I can do it. We can do the work, no problem, with one condition, that you pay my, a trip f for me to go to Sichuan and see the block. Mm. And I said, well, you are, you're hired, because that was the real person, you know. Right. It's no nonsense. And effectively, he went to Sichuan, he saw the marble, he approved it. And we brought it in. It was uh, thirty thousand pounds is a, is a very heavy block. Mm -hmm. So then the adventure started. Uh, they took a couple of months without no weekends. Three people. How many people working? Three. Three, three people. Yeah. yeah, day and night. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean eight hours a day, nonstop. Yeah. Amazing people. And then the cradle. Uh, where did you uh, cast the grounds? You there, designed that. I designed that. I made I made the model, and uh, it was cast also by a founder in Beijing that I know. Right. And did you make the whole piece? Um, did you make a model of the boat first, like in plaster? Or something? I made I made a a one to one model. A one to one model. One to one model. Yes, I made that took uh, that took a lot of uh, of work too. Mm -hmm. You know, I have 
we made the whole thing in clay, we had to yeah. make a mold and etc. Yeah. It was the yeah. entire thing. Because when I want to see it, yeah. because it was the size or something was something wrong with it. Uh, yeah, and it has a shape. It's yeah. not arbitrary. It's not it's arbitrary. It's not just a boat. Exactly. Yeah. So I, um, we had the time of, uh, of refining and making exactly the way we, we, mm -hmm. we wanted already in clay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the model is still there. And the, the title of it, Psyche, is that from the myth of Psyche and Eros? Yes, absolutely. And absolutely. what is that, uh, how does that myth, what, tell us about the myth and how it relates to this piece. Psyche in Greek, you mm -hmm. say, you don't say psyche, mm -hmm. you say psyche, psyche ke eros. Uh, I love this, the, the, the myth of, uh, of eros and psyche. I like the idea of the, this profound connection between, uh, and also this connection between the soul and erotic love, because eros is not agape, it's not love for humanity or for your children. Eros is about erotic love. So that, that there is a, a profound connection between erotic love and the soul. It's fascinating. And also that there is a disconnection be, be, because erotic love can be turned off by the inquisitiveness of, of the soul, which, which is the myth, right? When she tries to see who was Eros, he tries and approaches a lamp to him and then he wakes up their ideal is, is finished at that point. So I mean, I'm very interested in, in mythology, I'm interested in, uh, in, I think that all of those um, myths are absolutely, uh, they're totally contemporary. Mm -hmm. Just one look at Hollywood and this is all mythology. Right. Uh, look at this X-Men and all that, I mean, it's, it's incredible. We have, it's like uh, we are in India with all the flying heroes and gods and, and demons and all that. Yeah, the archetypes. That archetypes, that, of course. Uh, that continue to resonate with us. Absolutely. Um, when um, um, you, you've made a number of, uh, of monumental works, both for indoors and outdoors, uh, and public works, um, such as the fountains that you've done in Europe. And, uh, and, and you also had an outdoor exhibition here in New York Yes, um, on Broadway of, uh, of, of many of these uh, monumental pieces. Um, what is it about working large that, uh, that intrigues you and challenges you? The challenge is, when you work on a large piece, is to make something that is uh, good, that's smart, that is, that is good art, and at the same time engage the public. The public should be engaged. There is no reason to, to, to uh, throw something at their face that they absolutely cannot relate to. Maybe there is a value to that, but I, I don't believe in that. I be, uh, at least for my work. You know, I totally accept. I mean, other, other artists have other uh, uh, ideas about, but I mean, public art, either, I, I don't like this idea that either on one side you have a statue or, you know, of a, a general on a horse. On the other side, you have a form that is completely impossible for people to relate to. Yeah. So I, I would I like to, to make things that can be that you, people can find a connection, even if it's it doesn't matter what kind of connection. There. And uh, so I tried that in my first uh, piece, which was the Mercury Fountain in in Reston, Virginia, which was a fountain marble that I, marble fountain, marble and bronze that I, and the idea of that fountain was, since we were in the middle of uh, uh, postmodernism, postmodern architecture and all that, and I thought I would like to make something that would be made by uh, uh, somebody who read about postmodernism without having ever seen any example of it, and would then decide to make a postmodernist thing just from uh, from reading about it without any possible example. Right. And I came up with something that looked more like a 19th, 19th century fountain. And, uh, and it is theoretically is postmodernism, mm -hmm. but visually nobody would even imagine that. So 
it's 40 years into your career, into your creative career now. How do you think you brought drawing, your initial interest, into sculpture for which you've become internationally known? How, how I brought drawing? Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, draw I mean, which was your initial interest? How, but draw how, after all this time, do you see the relationship between how you started and where you're at now? I see. I, for me, drawing is uh, like breathing. I draw every day, it's, but it's just a way of thinking. I think drawing is for enough, at least for me, is a way of thinking. How I think, I think with a pencil. This is this is how I do it. And, and when it, you when you though, realize a form. Is it like, um, does it become a physical sense of like drawing in space? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I, I, uh, I think one of my visions of, uh, of sculpture is that it is an infinite amount of drawing. Uh, it's a series of lines. Mm -hmm. You go around and you, and you get lines, you get, you get silhouettes. For me, I cannot really separate drawing from, from sculpture. Like the drawing is, is essential for uh, in it. Yeah. And I think, too, the fact that, that you have content within your work. And you, when you started you, your uh, artistic career as drawing illustrations and stuff, which had content as well, that there's somehow there's still a parallel there, that there's still, there's still an investigation that sparks your interest. That, um, that, but yet, the, the way that you do it is quite different. Yeah. Drawing and writing. I'm interested in philosophy, I'm interested in, uh, in science. Mm -hmm. Actually, before I, I, I even started drawing, I mean, I, I, my interest was physics. When I realized that I was, uh, I was going to be an artist, I came to my father and I told him, Daddy, I know that we moved to Sao Paulo because so I would uh, study and uh, my interest was mathematics and physics. But I think I'm an artist. I think I have to, uh, to you know, change my... my uh, uh, my ideas about my future, and my father uh, waited. He, did, he was in silence for a minute. Then he said, "All right, but you have to promise me one thing. I'm going to support you all the way, but you have to promise one thing." I said, "What is it? Be a good artist. I I would hate you to be a mediocre one." <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you still use the, the mathematics and the and the physics. I do, in yes. The, in yes. the realization of your forms. Yes, I think I do, yes. Well. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I, uh, well. I, I, I've always admired your work, and now I feel like I know a little bit more about it. Thank you for your questions, Paul. It's great. <laughs>